morning, let's uh, dive into what we are dealing with. We are in 2 Corinthians, we are in these letters. Um, as you all know, Paul is very practically just addressing a whole bunch of different things in the church. Last week, we spoke about the fact that we have a greater covenant, remember? We spoke about the fact that uh, we are no longer under the law, but we are under grace, hallelujah. It is no longer on us to produce something, but rather we are living in the finished work of Jesus. That is good news. We are accepted and we are beloved, and it is awesome, and everybody left church last Sunday happy, excited, and pumped. It is my job this morning to make you angry at me again. <laughs> It's been one week of not anger, and it's good to go back to that place. So we're going to be dealing with a very touchy subject this morning, um, and we'll get into it. So, so let's, let's go. 2 Corinthians 8, 7 to 9. Um, this is a holy cow, if there ever was one. Uh, but since you excel in everything, look at Paul. Awesome job. Paul's going to do a whole bunch of compliments at the beginning, a whole bunch of compliments at the end and then fire you in the middle. It's like a sandwich, right? Um, but since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of, drumroll, giving. And um, <clears throat> we're going to get into it this morning, but before you go to a whole bunch of different places in your mind, this is not giving your love. This is not giving a smile. Um, we want your smiles. We want your love. Uh, this is not giving a good attitude. Paul is very literally talking about cold, hard finances and cash. This is a money thing that Paul is discussing here. I'm not commanding you, but I want to taste the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And we finally have arrived at this moment in the series where we are going to be dealing with finances a little bit this morning. Um, we're really going to get into it. I'm going to try to make it as, as, practically, as practical as I possibly can. But I wanted to kick off this morning by making it a little bit more light, let's break the ice a little bit. Let's have a bit of a laugh before we get into it. So I'm gonna, we're going to play a little bit of a game. And what we're going to do is, is I'm going to describe a movie to you. And uh, you tell me if you know what the movie is. So I'll describe it. You tell me if you know what it is. So we're going to describe a couple. First one is depressed office worker joins a cult and destabilizes the government. Let's put it on the screen. What is it? It's The Matrix. <laughs> Unsuspecting boy is recruited by a creepy old loner into a game of lies, crime, and terrorism. Put it up. Chris's spoiler alert, man. <laughs> yeah, he, no, he knows me too well is the problem. Priest kidnaps child for uprising and eventual marriage to a politician twice his age. Oh, keep quiet. Is this the nerd group over here? The nerdy nerd group over here. Okay, let's see if you get this one. Pensioner takes dream cruise and throws away children's inheritance. <laughs> I think that's kind of funny. <laughs> Put it up. Wow, no one got that one. <laughs> Remember at the end, she throws the diamond. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see if you get this one. Now we're going to get into it. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You are putting a lot of effort into this, but you aren't getting much out of it. A lot of effort, but still something is missing. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse filled with holes in it. 
Very few of you have seen this, but this is from the movie Too Many People's Current Financial Situation. <laughs> this is actually from Haggai 1, verses 5 to 7. And um, we're making light of this, but is that not actually scary when you read that portion of Scripture? And as I read through it in the week, I could not help but feel like it is so, so, so accurate when it comes to the situation we find ourselves in as a culture and even we find ourselves in as a people. And in this moment, he describes just the situation where we're doing all these things and we're trying to desperately, we're trying to acquire wealth and we're trying to do this and we're trying to do that, but it never feels like there is enough. There's just never, ever enough. And I really feel like this is such an accurate depiction of the culture that we are actually in now, especially when it comes to finances. I, um, I'm going to tell you that I have great difficulty talking about finances. I don't really know why. I've just never been comfortable with speaking about money. Um, I've actually taken jobs having no idea what it is they were going to pay me because at no point in the interview process did I actually want to ask the question how much money they were going to pay me because I was afraid of how they would perceive me. I did not want to be seen as a person that is just totally into money. So personally, I've always struggled with speaking about money. And then when we look at the church world, what becomes difficult is is there's been a lot of abuse when it comes to finances in the church. Um, churches have abused finances. Pastors have abused finances. So if you take my own personal weirdness with finances and you put it on top of what we've seen and experienced in the church, I've just sort of had this outset, I've had this mindset that I'm just not going to address it. I just don't want to talk about finances. I don't want to speak to you about finances. I don't want to speak to anybody about finances. We're all just going to do our thing, and we're going to go through life, and that's going to be how it is. But the reality is this, and God really convicted me on this actually about two years ago. The reality is, is that we are not doing our job shepherding you. We are not doing our job discipling you if we don't ever touch or speak on finances. And that's just the truth of the matter. You know, um, I was thinking about it this morning, how we will get upset about certain sins, right? We'll get worked up about certain sins. We'll see certain sins in the culture. We'll see all the stuff going on in the realm of sexual sins, and we'll get worked up, and we'll get angry, and we'll, we'll say things like, this has to be addressed. We have to talk about this. We have to put down a marker. So there's some, some sins that we're keen on talking about because we've got to get it out there. But then when it comes to greed... <laughs> which is probably the biggest thing we're all dealing with hands down. We just don't ever want to deal with it and we don't want to speak about it. So this morning, I think it's important that we need to understand that as uncomfortable as it can be, there is no being a disciple if we don't understand what God is calling us to do with our money. Um, there's two things that I think money will do very, very quickly in your life. The first one is it will become your God very quickly. Nothing will become an idol in your life quicker than finances will. Money will become your God very quickly. We are not called to worship money. We are called to receive money as a gift and use it to worship God. So money should never be our God. The second thing that money will do very, very quickly is money will become a slave driver. Money will capture you. It will hold you. It will entangle you. I cannot, I cannot tell you how often I have conversations with people where they feel like they've got something on their heart that God is calling them to do, but the one thing that's standing in their way is money. It's either the letting go of money or the getting money or not enough money. There's always something with money, but I need you to understand this morning that money is not our God. Money does not have control over us. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to worship God, and we are called to walk in freedom of everything, and that includes money. The Bible does not say that money is the root of all evil. Did you know that? The Bible says it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. Money in and of itself can do amazing things. We are sending 45 kids away on youth camp this week. They are going to encounter Jesus in a powerful way. 
part of the reason it's somewhat affordable for these kids to go is because of the giving you give into this place so that it puts us into a position where we can make it affordable, right? That is the power of money. That is what money can do. But the love of money, trust in money, hope in money, the hold money can have on you. The Bible actually says that that is the root of all evil. It's not just a little bit bad. It is a lot bad. As a matter of fact, there's this moment in the Gospels where the rich, it, it says the, the, this rich young man comes up to Jesus and he says to Jesus, listen, I've done everything the law requires of me, which I just want to give you a little tip um, when you approach Jesus. Don't ever approach Jesus and go, I've done everything you've told me to do, pal. Don't do that. <laughs> do not do that. You have not done everything Jesus has asked you to do. You are breathing because of his grace, not because of anything you've done. So do not approach him like that. He approaches him like that, and Jesus turns around and says, okay, well, there's one, one teensy tiny little thing you still need to do. Go get rid of all of your stuff and come back to me. And the man actually leaves sad. And um, I don't think the man, I don't think Jesus sends him away because stuff in and of itself is bad. I think Jesus sends him away because Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, you need to be free from everything else. As long as your possessions have a hold on you, you can't follow me the way I want you to follow me. 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 18, and I'll tell you this, it's, it's actually remarkable how often money and finances comes across in the New Testament and even Jesus, how often he speaks about it. It's a lot. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17 to 18 starts off by saying, command those who are rich in this present world. Now, let me pause there quickly. If we were doing this in any other country in the world, I probably would not have to pause at this moment. But because we are in the United States of America, we're going to pause for a moment because I know what's going on right now. I've got a psychic gift. As I say, command those who are rich in this present world, most of you are going, I'm not rich. So you've shut off. I want to help you quickly this morning just to gain a little bit of perspective. If you own a television set, if you own a motor vehicle, if you have as much as $1 in a savings account, and if you are physically bringing in any kind of an income, you are in the 1% richest people on the face of the planet. So good morning, one percenters. How are we doing this morning? <laughs> right? In the grand scheme of where we are in the world and in the grand scheme of where we've come from as humanity, I want to tell you that right now here in Mount Dora, Florida, we are as comfortable as human beings have ever been. We are living in the lap of luxury. And I know what's going on. You were cursing the heavens last week when your air conditioning unit went out. Hello. <laughs> You realize you have an air conditioning unit, right? <laughs> Puts you right up there. I never saw one my entire time living in South Africa. Now every house has one in the U.S., right? We are actually very, very blessed. So let's move on here. He says, command those who are rich in this present world. He then says, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. And, uh, and let me pause here. This is a big one. This is a big, big, big one. I want to I just emphasize here for a second. There's a massive difference between being responsible with your money and putting your hope in your wealth. Please hear me today. There's a difference between those two. As Christians, we are called to be responsible with our finances, but we are not called to put our hope in wealth, uh, which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. So the Bible is telling us here that if you are a wealthy person, which we've established that most of us are wealthy if we look at what, what's going on in the rest of the world, we have a responsibility and that responsibility is twofold. Number one, we should not put our hope in our wealth. 
And number two, we should be generous with our money. We should be people that are giving and generous and loving and free from holding on to things. This is where Christianity is so countercultural, it's not even funny. Because the world will tell you that it's all about accumulating and holding. Christianity will tell you it's all about living an open-handed life where it comes through you to others to bless others and to honor God. It is completely countercultural. The sad thing is, is that um, statistics show us that the more money people earn, the smaller the giving in their lives become. Can you actually believe that? That is statistically true, that especially within the church, that percentage-wise, giving in the church actually gets smaller the more people earn in their lives, not bigger. Um, I can honestly tell you that one of the traps I have fallen into in my own life is I will tell myself the lie that if I have a certain amount, I will then start to give a certain amount, right? (laughs) I'll start to cut these deals with God, me and God. I'm like, okay, let's sit down. Let's have a cup of coffee. This is what I'm asking you to do. If you do this, then I'll do that. So in other words, if you give me what I perceive to be enough, which that is a shady area because I can't define for you what enough is, then I will become a generous person. I want to tell you this morning that generosity has nothing to do with how much you have. Nothing. Generosity has nothing to do with what the bank account numbers are in your bank account. Generosity has everything to do with you trusting God as your provider. That's the fruit of generosity. That is the foundation of generosity. Generosity flows out of a life that trusts and believes in God as the provider. Generosity does not come out of a life that has a lot because a lot shifts all the time. I remember when Linda and I first moved here from South Africa, Um, we really did not have two cents to rub together. I remember the first time the two of us actually both were kind of working and we were both bringing in checks. I'll never forget. I was like, we are the richest people that have ever lived. I never need more than this. We are flying. This $30,000 a year, we are millionaires, multi-zillionaires. We're going to conquer the world 17 times over And it's unbelievable how enough is just not enough, is just not enough, is just not enough. And then one day you're upset because your refrigerator's little TV is broken and the filter on the fridge isn't working the way it should, and your fifth television in bedroom number four isn't functioning, and you're like, we just need more money. It's never going to fix it, right? It's like this thing we just read in Haggai, enough is never enough. And as Christians, we need to find our fulfillment in Jesus, and we need to trust with all of our hearts that He is the one that provides for us. So that's sort of the framework of what I wanted to say to you, but now what I would like to do is I want to get as practical as I can because money is a very practical thing. So as we talk about How can we actually practically live our lives in such a way that we can honor Jesus in every area of our lives, even our finances? I want to give you four principles that I really believe will help you and that will empower you to do exactly that. So the first principle I want you to look at is this one. Debt is bad. (laughs) Uh, It's like Google Gaga baby talk, debt debt is bad. Proverbs 22 verse 7 says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is safe to the lender. Now, as I say debt is bad, you all start laughing at me because you're all going, wow, this is what you came up with in the week. This is really, this is the most basic thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I hear you. I totally hear you, but check this out. The average American has $50,000 of debt. (laughs) So as much as we're all sitting here giggling about the fact that debt's bad, we're all also looking at our phones going, boy, better pay that credit card off soon, right? 
Debt is bad, and debt will ultimately make a slave out of you. I remember a couple of years ago, Linda and I went through an IKEA phase, right? I, I think we've all been through an IKEA phase at one point or another. I think it was more the Swedish meatballs than it was the furniture. But anyways, we would go to IKEA. <laughs> David Oliver Willis loves the IKEA lunch, I know that. We would go and we would buy the stuff and you'd be all excited because we're all handymen. And then you get home and it's these weird little pictures and uh, nothing makes sense and you just want a YouTube video but it's not there because it's a bunch of Swiss people or Finnish people. I don't know what it is. Um, and eventually you follow the instructions up to a point and then if you're an American man, you take it, crumple it up, throw it over your shoulder and now you're just going to go with a feeling and intuition. And... Uh, I never forget, I got a little bit into the project, I looked around, I could not find the instruction manual, and I was not going to spend four minutes of my precious time looking for the instruction manual. Time is money, people, and I don't have that kind of time. So I decided that I was going to build this thing on feel, and I did what I needed to do, and I took three steps back five hours later, and it looked like a jigsaw puzzle, right? And I tried to put the final draw in, and it just did not want to go in. So I thought to myself, let me just, let me just sort of heave it in. <laughs> let me just force it in. Now, I want to say this to you. If you're planning on going to Ikea at any point, none of the Ikea products require a forceful <laughs> maneuvering, right? It's not how it works. It actually works pretty smoothly when you do what you need to do. I finally called Linda upstairs. Um, she was horrified. She told me that I needed to do the whole thing from scratch. I then had to go find the manual, and I had to rebuild the entire Kia cabinet because I wasted a lot of my time. I tell you this whole antidotal story to tell you this. At the heart of debt is impatience. It's impatience. It is our desire to, to feel and to have whatever it is we want to feel and we want to have immediately. And I want to tell you this morning that one of the things that we're called to as Christians is we are called to be patient. We are called to be long-suffering. We are not supposed to satisfy every craving and every need of the flesh immediately. And I understand that there's certain debts we need to take on. I understand that there's a mortgage on your house. I understand things like that. But the kind of debt I'm talking about this morning is the kind of debt where you are desperately trying to fill a need and you're not patient and you don't want to wait and you want to just do it immediately. Essentially what you're doing is, is you're taking a shortcut. Debt is a shortcut. And I want to tell you this morning that shortcuts never work out. Shortcuts ultimately cost you money, cost you time, put you in all kinds of emotional stress. It does not ultimately work. Debt is bad. If you are in tons of debt, I want to encourage you to get out of debt. Um, as I was reading some of the stuff in the week, um, one of the reasons they say people have debt is because most people, nine, as a matter of fact, it says this, 90% of people don't operate with a budget. I mean, <laughs> you need to operate with a budget. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, let me confess my sins before you this morning. Um, I have debt in my life, uh, so I will say that to you. The second thing I'll say to you is, is that we have a budget. At some point, Linda and I sat down and we put together a budget. And we were super proud of that budget. And we spoke about it and we high-fived. We never looked at the budget ever again. Don't actually know where it is. It's under the Ikea cabinet somewhere. <laughs> so, so you need to know where your money is going. Um, you need to be responsible. So that's number one this morning. Debt is bad. Number two, stuff is meaningless. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. America has a stuff problem. We love stuff. Even our turkeys. Stuffing. That was weak, sorry. Luke 12, verses 16 to 21. This is Jesus speaking. Listen to what he says here. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my bonds and build bigger ones. 
and there I will store my surplus of grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain. You laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I was so excited when I read this in the week. I was going to get the tattoo of take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. I was on my way to the tattoo parlor. And then I read this. But God said to him, you fool. (laughs) This very night your life will be demanded from you. I was like, turn the car around. We're going back to the house. Um, (laughs) Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Woo! If you thought the Haggai one was rough, this hits like a hammer, doesn't it? I can tell you honestly, I'm at a place in my neighborhood where we can't drive in the streets anymore. Can't do it. Every single house has a garage or a motor home. There's never been a bigger lie told than the word motor home because there's not a motor in the United States of America that has a home. They live in the streets, y'all. They live in the streets. I've seen where the cars live. They don't live in the motor homes or in the garages. You know why? Because we all need 500 square feet rooms just to put our stuff, right? We're just putting stuff everywhere. And then when that doesn't work, we will hire somebody as a professional organizer to come and help us store our stuff. And if that doesn't work, we will go get extra places to store our stuff. Do you know, this is crazy, that the storage industry, which barely existed three decades ago, is now larger than the music industry. 45,000 of the 5,000 storage facilities on earth exist in the United States of America. Woo! We have a stuff problem, ladies and gentlemen. And then we're all standing next to our Dodge Ram $70,000 trucks, and we're going, I'm really hurting at the gas pump right now. (laughs) I know how you can fix that. Get rid of the truck. (laughs) You won't be hurt with the gas, (laughs) right? (laughs) Oh, boy. Please don't leave our church. Next week will be better. Um, But uh, I remember, and and the point is this morning is that stuff, stuff really holds us down. I, I, I was watching this program where this person was doing a hike through the wilderness and um, essentially, they were giving tips and keys on how to hike through the wilderness. And in this program, not that I have any intention of ever hiking through the wilderness. I just got into a YouTube zone. You know what I mean? And uh, they were essentially saying that the key is to pack light. You've got to pack light. And this person went into all kinds of creative ways to even make the toothpaste lighter and to do this and to do that. Because if you're on the move, if you're on mission, if you're living your life like an adventure, if you're going somewhere... You don't want to be bogged down. You don't want to be held down with a lot of stuff. And I know this is a practical example of somebody that's walking through the wilderness, but I truly believe that as Christians, we're all called on into a mission. We're all called into an adventure. We're all called to go where God is calling us to go. It becomes difficult to go if you're bogged down with a ton of stuff. Last thing I'll say on this is, is that you will survive without your stuff. When, uh, when we moved from South Africa to the States, I remember we sort of spoke to the airline, and each one of us could bring one bag and one carry-on. That's what we could do to come to the U.S. We were living in South Africa at the time, and essentially I said to the kids, I sat them down, I said to them, whatever you can fit into a bag is what's coming with you for the rest of your life. And there was gnashing of teeth and there was tears, and there was ashes, and there was sackcloth. I think one even ran away for two days. There was all kinds of stuff going on. But you know what's amazing? We moved here, and six months later, we all still had our limbs. We were all still breathing. Somehow we survived getting rid of the stuff. So let's declutter. Let's get rid of stuff. Stuff is meaningless. Third one, saving is good. Proverbs 21, verses 20 The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. It is good to make sure that we are saving 
savings will do two things essentially in your life. It will help you with the other two problems. If you are a person that is putting money away, it is an act of discipline. You are teaching yourself to be disciplined, which is again a principle of Christianity. But if we have a savings account, the odds of us needing to go into debt when an unexpected bill comes up goes down dramatically. I know that in the future, you will have unexpected bills coming up. But I can tell you for a fact, you will have unexpected bills coming up. So prepare yourself for the unexpected bill because it's not unexpected, it is going to come. So that's number one. When you have a savings account, you, you help yourself from spending money on debt. The second thing that happens when you have a savings account is you end up buying less stuff. <laughs> so, so I'm going to throw my kids under the bus here. But I cannot tell you how many times this has happened with my kids, but we'll be in the store, they'll see a thing, and they'll go, I have to have it. I have to have that item. That is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. If we don't have that, I'm going to die. I'm going to cease to exist. I need to have it. I then go, well, Christmas is coming. This will be like January 22nd. <laughs> they go, I hate Christmas. I'm like, I get it, but you know, Christmas is coming, so you, it will still be, I mean, if you need it for your life, then that's fine. Then I'll say your second option is, is you can actually start saving up some money. How many of you know that they never actually get to the desired amount of money they're saving and still buy the thing? Because by the time five minutes have gone past, the thing that was going to change their life, they're not even thinking about anymore. So when we are actually disciplined in saving, not only does it help with debt, but it will help us not to buy compulsively all the time. Fourth thing, fourth principle this morning, giving is fun. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 11. Listen to what Paul says here. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever." Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Paul is telling us here that the only life to live is a life that is one of giving. There's this moment where Paul says that God loves a cheerful giver. You know, for the longest time, I remember reading that portion of Scripture and using it in my advantage to be stingy. <laughs> I am very good at justifying anything. This is what I told myself. I told myself that if I'm not happy with the giving, God doesn't want me to give. So the key to keeping God happy and to never giving anything away is to just be grouchy when it comes to giving. Solved. Problem solved. I don't think that's what it's saying. I believe that what it is saying here this morning is this. Those who live generously will be joyful. Those that live generously will be cheerful. Those who actually live an open-handed life will be those who experience a joy that nobody else experiences. I really believe that as we trust in the Lord, as we exercise generosity, we will experience a joy that you can't experience in anything else. One of the things that I do is I take the dogs occasionally to the dog park, and I have the tennis ball, and I'll throw it, and they love it. It's their favorite thing in the world, and they will run like crazy. They'll catch the ball, and then what will happen is this. They'll run all the way back to me. I'm like this. Here we go. They'll run all the way to there, and then they'll make like a nosedive to the right or to the left, and then they won't actually give me the ball back. And I'm like, listen, the only way this works is you've got to give me the ball back. 
If you don't give me the ball back, everything is done. It's finished. We're wasting our time. I'm not going to stay at the dog park for four days. you got an hour max. Give me the ball back. And then typically what happens is I've got to wrestle them to the ground, and then I'll put my hand in their mouths. It's disgusting. And I'm sort of wrestling the ball out, and they slobber everywhere, and the dog bites me. And then eventually I'll throw the slobbery ball. And at best, there's like three throws during the hour. And I'm going, listen to me, dog. If you would just open up your mouth and release the ball, I will throw it again. I am faithful in the throwing if you will be faithful in the letting going. Man, they just don't get it. And I really feel like that's how God is with us sometimes. I feel like God is like, listen, if you just let it go, I'll throw it again. Oh, I've got so much up here. It's insane. The streets are made of gold. Just, just let it go, bro. Let the $10 go. <laughs> I've got more where that came from. Tip the lady, tip, tip, it's okay. I know you had to wait five minutes for your burrito instead of the three minutes, but just give the tip. I will fill the gap. And I'm telling you now, when we live an open-handed life, it becomes fun because now we're in this zone and we're in this rhythm with Jesus where as we are blessing those, as we're his hands and feet, he just keeps providing and keeps providing. I remember my pastor in South Africa always used to say, you can't outgive God. And it's so true. You cannot outgive God. I can tell you that I've been in the privileged situation in my life where people have given me cars. There have been times where I've been in desperate need of a car, so I've been blessed with a car. I can also tell you that I've been in places in my life where I've had the honor and the privilege of giving away a car. And I can tell you giving it away is so much more fun. It is so much more awesome. So when we actually live lives of cheerful giving, it is unbelievable how we are going to experience a sense of joy. I think the second reason we experience joy when we give is because when we become giving people, we actually take on the very nature of God. Because God is a giver. For God so loved the world that he gave. That is literally his nature. So I want to end off this morning by doing two things. And uh, I'm going to give you two things to do um, as two practical sort of action steps as we leave here today. The first one is ask God what he wants from you. That's it. That's all I'm asking you to do. Listen to what it says here in 2 Corinthians. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. So here's the deal this morning. Every single one of us are called to give. Every single one of us. Every single one of us are called to give to the poor. Every single one of us are called to give to the church. Every single one of us are called to give to whatever cause it is that you might need to give to, a loved one, a family member. There's a certain amount that God is calling every single one of us to give, but it says here that you need to have clarity in your own heart as to what that looks like and what that is. And in different seasons, in different times, it will look differently to different people. But what I'm asking you to do this morning is, is I'm asking you to go to the Lord and asking Him, Lord, what shall I give? That's step number one. Let me help you out here for a minute. If you feel like there is no answer from the Lord as to what you should give, the Bible tells us all throughout the Old Testament that He requires a tithe. So in the case of silence, tithe is your easiest go-to step, and tithe is essentially 10% of your income. I know what some of you are thinking. Are you out of your mind? Did you just say the word 10%? Yes, I did. But I can tell you right now that as you get to that place of releasing and letting go of, man, God just keeps filling up that cup. I believe it's in Malachi where the Lord says, bring your tithe to the storehouse. Test me in this. It's the only time where God says, test me. So the first thing is, ask yourself where it is God is asking you to give and how much. And then second thing I'm going to ask you to do this morning is this. Just do it. <laughs> just do it. Don't take forever. Don't take five years. Don't pray on this for the next 20 years. Don't make this a long thing. Don't do 40 days of fasting and prayer and all that stuff. What I'm saying to you is, is ask the Lord what it is He's asking you to do with your finances. 
and then jump into it and do what he's asking you to do. I'm going to make you a promise this morning. Never in my life have I ever seen God punish someone for being too generous. I've never seen it. Never seen anybody come to me in tears going, I thought God said this, but actually he wanted me to give less and now my life is falling apart. Never seen it, ever. So you can be safe in knowing that as you step out of faith, as you trust Him as your provider, as you let go and live an open-handed life, not only will He fill your cup, but I truly believe that you will walk in a joy and a freedom like you've never walked in before. Come, stand with me this morning. So Father God, I wanna thank you this morning that you are our treasure, you are our provider. I thank you, Lord, this morning that we don't have to trust in earthly things but we can trust in our heavenly Father. So Father, this morning, I know that this is a tough topic. I know, Lord, that for some of us, we've, we've struggled, Lord, and we've hurt in this area. So Father, for those of us this morning that are struggling in the area of our finances and we just are in a difficult spot, Father, I wanna pray for your provision. I wanna pray that you open up doors that no man can shut. I wanna pray, Lord, that you bring the provision that people are desperately needing in this place. Father, if we're in this place this morning and our, and our problem is the opposite, we're struggling to let go, we've made finances an idol, we're hanging on too tightly, then Father, I want to thank you that you will lead us, you will guide us, you will convict us and help us to live lives of freedom where we are not slaves to anything. We love you, Lord. We thank you for who you are this morning. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen.